My name is Dr. Peter Njiroge. I'm a research scientist at the National Museums of Kenya, Ornithology section. You are watching the Zingi Environmental Studies. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Bernard Muhia. Welcome to the Zingi Environmental Series. Uh, we are here with uh, John Kioli, the chairman of the Kenya change, Climate Change Working Group and also the executive director at the Green Africa Foundation. Karibu Kwasho. Thank you very much. I, I'd like to know how you got your, your how you got into climate change, working for climate change and climate action. Yeah, it's very interesting because um, my background was in uh, social science, mm -hmm. but um, later on, because of uh, my interest in uh, tree planting, my interest in uh, becoming the change in uh, environment, mm -hmm. I found myself there, and I even went ahead and studied uh, specific courses on climate change, including a master's degree on climate change. Yeah. How did uh, your passion in tree planting come about? I think I alluded to my late father. He was a florist and also a landscaper and also very keen on environment. So I allude all that from uh, his historical work he did for the Kenyan government, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and what excites you about climate action and uh, trees, tree planting in general? I think where I come from, uh, in the eastern part of the country, Kitui, mm -hmm. there is a lot of impacts on uh, climate change. Whereas it's only one part of the country, when you look at uh, almost 70% of this country is um, affected by issues of climate change. And when I see an action I've done, like drafting the Climate Change Act of 2016, which is now a law, mm -hmm. and other policies in the counties, and I see them working, and I see them guiding the issues around climate change. That to me is satisfaction, mm -hmm. yes. How did the act uh, come about? Uh, we drafted it. Um, it was initially a private member's bill. The Kenya Climate Change Working Group together with uh, other you know, um, donor partners and also the government of Kenya so that there was a need to have a standalone climate change act before there were more than 100 laws and policies touching on climate change but not specific on climate change so there was a need to have one omnibus that carries all issues of climate change in a holistic manner yes so for someone who hears of climate change but doesn't really understand it how would you break it down for them I would say it's a change of uh, weather that is recorded in more than 50 years. And uh, this is uh, more bigger than just uh, weather change, because weather is more of a daily thing. But when you see like um, drought becoming recurrent, water precipitation dropping, or even water precipitation increasing, the level of sea level increasing, then you notice that this is not usual. And what, that is what we call climate change because it is more of more gases that are now surrounding the atmosphere. And because of that, there is increase of temperature. Because of that, there is impact on other ecosystems in the world. Yes. And uh, another term, uh, global warming. Uh, how how would you also define that? It, it was to... yeah. It, climate change earlier was referred as global warming, okay. uh, but this was alluding to only the temperature rise. But uh, after some time, we also noticed that climate change is affecting many sectors. It's not just about uh, the the temperature change. It's about also increase of new diseases. Uh, increase of also uh, water levels 
in the ocean, increase of also issues around uh, water levels uh, going down or precipitation uh, not being very, very um, promising, especially in the arid areas. And this entirely affects the agriculture sector, the tourism sector, and uh, because Kenya is a, is a nature-based tourism destination, so that is an impact in terms of our economy. So then issues around climate change are more global and are more multi-sectorial, touching on almost every sector, yes. Technocrats use the term climate variability. Yes. How does it factor into all this? Yeah, it's, it's more of um, of increase of water and decreasing of water. And this is by natural uh, occurrence, okay? This, you cannot allude it to, to issues around human impacts, activities like um, increase of uh, CO2 by emissions of cars, by the factories, and by using uh, what we call dirty fuel or uh, biomass fuel. Uh, so it's more of a natural occurrence because, of course, apart from climate change, which is human induced, then there is also the natural things that happen. But climate change can only be registered for more than 50 years recordings whereby if there was a river here you are seeing the river is no longer there it's more dry if uh, you used to have a bumper harvest now it's no longer possible and then also drought recurrence it has increased meaning that there is a reason and most of it is humanly induced yes now how has climate change affected uh, your home area, Kitui? Well, um, first of all is uh, the issues around decreased precipitation of water, meaning that the rainfall, and uh, as we talk now in 2023, two years ago, we never had rain. We had rain like one month, and that was it. In fact, for the first time in December, the children who are two years old saw rain for the first time. So we are seeing that um, there was drought, there was impact uh, on livestock, there was impact on uh, food security, and uh, more important is also biodiversity. Uh, Kitui area was uh, initially very popular for honey, but the bees are no longer as many as they were meaning that it's something that is eating up yes. the bees yes. and uh, therefore you cannot have um, honey as much as you used to get. So this also affects the livelihoods. There are diseases also which are coming because of uh, issues around uh, uh, the increase of temperature. There are areas where farming was excellent, farming was assured, but now you cannot rely on rainfed agriculture, uh, yet this was possible in other years. So probably uh, you can allude this to climate change. Yeah. Matters to do with climate change are discussed at the UN level, at the COP, COP the Conference of Parties. And the last one was in, uh, in Africa, here in Egypt. Uh, what were your expectations going in and what were the outcomes uh, that you are both happy with and not impressed with? Yeah, I think most of the expectations of not only Kenya, but uh, Africa and developing countries was we were hoping to get um, loss and damage being discussed. This is mainly because we started having impacts over climate change during the agrarian revolution during the Industrial Revolution. Yes. Africa, Kenya, was not part of it. Even as we talk, 4% of emission is what is collectively emitted in Africa. So Kenya is 0.00 something. What that means is that we are being affected 
by something or by activities which somebody else outside yeah. Africa is benefiting. Yes. So what we are saying that uh, can we have a loss and damage basket whereby we can ensure our people, we can actually refund our people uh, resources that they lost, yes. livelihoods that they lost. If you recall, last year we lost more than 2 million livestock, yes. not counting even the wildlife, not counting human beings. So who will ever refund us that? So for the first time, this was negotiated in the COP27, and uh, although this will take time, at least there's a structure which is being crafted to talk to issues of loss and damage. The other thing is, um, of course, we're expecting that uh, acceleration of uh, adaptation uh, activities, because Kenya, as any other um, African country and developing countries, adaptation is a priority. We, has, we have been seeing a lot of attention on mitigation. So, whereas it's important, we need urgent attention to adaptation, which means that uh, we need resources immediately. This cannot be done by, by mitigation. So we need like quick actions, quick resources, to be able to jump to the next level. As we address mitigation, it's good, but our priorities were adaptation. This was not very well addressed in COP27. We are hoping that uh, COP28 will be an accelerator towards issues of uh, adaptation. The other bilateral um, components that His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency William Ruto, was able to manage in terms of uh, the ambitious plan of planting 15 billion trees by 2030. What that means, he was able to have bilaterals with the UN bodies, bilateral with other governments. And now we are seeing the fruits of that because the program is already started and we are hopeful that Kenya will restore its lost glory in terms of uh, tree planting, in terms of uh, uh, managing uh, its ecosystems, and this is also something that was a good takeaway from COP27. All right, so that was COP27. Uh, so this year it's COP28, and uh, the president has been appointed, uh, Sultan uh, Ahmed, uh, who is also a fossil fuel executive. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? First? I think it was not strategic because again, it's very difficult to talk against what you are doing. Yes. And um, it would have been in good faith to come up with uh, probably somebody from the environmental background, somebody who believes in uh, green energy, somebody who believes in, uh, in uh, issues around climate change. So it will take a lot of efforts to be able to tune the current uh, president, COP, pre, COP28 president, to fit purpose. But what I think is that um, the COP presidency, the COP process has its own system. So as much as, because it's, um, it's a task that we may not influence, but it's a task that we are disappointed. But it's a task that I think the system is already there on UF, UNF UNFCCC to ensure that we deliver the objectives of COP28. You talked of uh, climate adaptation. Uh, now, funding for, for those processes is very complex. Uh, how do you think it can be made possible for even the common citizen to be able to access that, that funding? I think one of the things is um, having homegrown solutions. We talk about money every time, but there are homegrown solutions in terms of uh, how we do things. I think there's an effort by the Minister of Agriculture and the counties to go to what was called orphan crops, to what was um, the crops that were abandoned, like cassava, millet, sorghum, 
these are crops that can withstand um, you know issues around climate change Kenya needs to complement its um, nature-based tourism with some other comp component of maybe culture destination or uh, other destination that is not only um, stuck with nature-based solutions, nature-based uh, destination. Because again, if the trends are going this way, then the wildebeest that uh, the tourists come and see, they are slowly diminishing. But if we had um, like a um, uh, destination for healthcare, yes. people coming to Kenya for hospitals, mm -hmm. coming to Kenya for other needs, like IT needs or uh, other destinations. Like Ethiopia doesn't rely on, on uh, nature for its tourism. So if we can be able to have transformational thinking in terms of uh, knowing that this trend will go this way, so it's up to the country to reorganize itself. I think the other thing is um, the change maker is in energy. Uh, when we look at uh, issues of uh, adopting uh, new uh, renewable energy and uh, also um, shifting, especially in the cooking um, industry, if we can be able to adopt uh, energy efficiency and also renewable energy switch, um, solarizing our boreholes, I think these quick actions, although they are in uh, mitigation, there will be an additional way of managing issues around climate change in this country. So we need to rethink all sectors. We need to rethink and plan. And as we put resources in both adaptation and mitigation, we also plan as a country and also put resources in research and preparedness, early warning systems so that then as a country, we are prepared to deal with issues of climate change. You mentioned energy. Um, how can we package uh, energy to attract investment? And uh, secondly, electric vehicles, uh, your take on that? When you talk about uh, energy access, yes. it needs to be affordable, it needs to be reliable, it needs to have equity in terms of distribution and, uh, if possible, renewable. So one of the things that we need to start with is uh, energy efficiency. Can we bring down the input in terms of biomass, input in terms of feedstock to go down? If you are using 10 kilos in a day to use your jiko, can you bring it down to around three? So there are mechanisms of having energy savings GCOS that are able to do that. Then as we see where possible, we can have biogas. Where possible, then we can have also uh, where people can afford. Nowadays, there are pressure cookers which are using electricity that are more efficient and also cheaper to use. In terms of um, e-mobility, I think Kenya needs to have its uh, policies right, it needs to put an attractive mechanism, environment for investors. But most important now, um, as we encourage the mobility sector, we need to encourage also the infrastructure. Because the thing that will boost these vehicles is, especially in the motorcycle, is a change of batteries. If I want to change to a battery which is charged, are there places I can drop my battery, then pick a new one which is charged and move on? Just like the car batteries, whereby if it's done, you throw it. But in this case, you can have stations around the country whereby you can restore, you can leave your old, uh, your uncharged battery and get the charged battery. So as we look at uh, how we expand, let's also look at the policies, Let's also look at the enabling environment in terms of taxation. Let's also look at um, the infrastructure itself, because infrastructure will support the system. True. Now, around the world, uh, there's uh, increasing hostility towards environmental 
environmental activists uh, with some being jailed, others killed. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's an issue of um, advocacy. It's an issue of um, people knowing what environment is and the benefits. I think the environmentalists need also to package the information in a way that the ruling class is able to understand, the communities are able to understand, so that it doesn't look like every time you are at heads, but uh, we'll still do our work. Yes. Uh, so we've been speaking to John Curley, uh, the chairman of the Kenya Climate Change Working Group, and also the executive director of the Green Africa Foundation. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for your time. Uh, and we look forward to a very climate-friendly future. Excellent. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah.